Hi, my name is Ethan Bogle. I'm a senior at Stanford University Online High School, and my talk is titled Developing a Culture of Computational Thinking. Uh, I am talking about a curriculum for a computational thinking course pilot that I designed and am running this year at my school. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Ethan Bogle. I am a senior at Stanford University Online High School. Uh, and I'm here to talk today about developing a culture of computational thinking. It's great to see you all. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about a curriculum that I designed for a pilot course about computational thinking at my school. Uh, and the purpose behind the curriculum is basically to spread computational thinking, building interest and excitement uh, in my school community, uh, develop a culture of computational thinking, as it were. Uh, given an audience who does not know about computational thinking, uh, and especially if the, since there's not necessarily another common interest to leverage, uh, how do you catch somebody's interest? And, and basically, this, I'm gonna be talking about the design that I have for uh, achieving that. So uh, different amounts of uh, uh, opportunities for students to spend however much time they have available, uh, the presentations uh, on topics each week, uh, various other things, and I'll show a few examples uh, and talk about my experiences using the curriculum so far. So, kind of my journey, I really liked computational thinking Wolfram language. Uh, I attended the 2018 Wolfram summer camp uh, and started a computational thinking club at my school last year. Uh, but then I kind of realized I, I wanted to do a little bit more. Computational thinking is something that's not just a hobby or interest, it's something that can be more widely applicable. And so I, I actually proposed a course to my school administration. Uh, and uh, to my surprise, they actually said, how about you teach a pilot course? And so I was at the 2019 Wolfram Summer School uh, building the curriculum for that course, which I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, all this goal being to develop a culture of computational thinking. So this is the pitch that I made for the, the course as an advertisement to students. And volume is not transmitting. So this, this pitch basically being uh, uh, the advertisement. So uh, the main design piece behind, the main uh, idea behind the design is basically you're taking a group of people who don't know what computational thinking is and you're trying to convince them to learn about computational thinking on their own time because that's where we are right now. Uh, and the key thing is you're not doing that through, you're not assigning work necessarily because you can't do that yet. Otherwise we wouldn't need something like this. Uh, but instead, it's through getting their interest. So let's see. So 
there you, at the end you saw Dr. Hoshi, who's actually our head of school. Uh, he, uh, I, officially it's his thing, but I'm, I'm basically running it, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, so as I was starting to say, so basically how do we convince stu the students to spend their own time? Uh, and, and the way we do that is we present it something that they can apply to their, everything that they already are doing. So it's not this new hobby or this new uh, academic subject they have to add. It's something that helps them do the things they're already doing. Uh, and honestly, that's kind of why I fell in love with the Wolfen language. I'm, I'm a math person. I, my, I like that Wolfen language can do math, but the reason I love Wolfen language is because it can do everything, not just math. So that's kind of my philosophy. Of, that's what we should be doing. That's how we spread it. Um, so the goal, in other words, being to develop computational literacy so that uh, students can apply that to the things they're already doing. Uh, so basically, sessions as I designed them were, there's two pieces. There's the topics presentations, there's work time. Uh, and basically, the topics presentation is my chance to say, hey, here's something you can do with the Wolfen language. And that's get something they can then jump off of if they are interested, if they find that interesting. Uh, and then the work time is the time for them to pursue that or to do something else. So they can either be working through kind of the technical aspects of elementary instruction to the Wolfen language, or they can do another exploratory activity, uh, whatever they find interesting uh, for themselves. And uh, then I also have an exit ticket that basically allows me to keep track of what students are up to, and I hold weekly office hours. Uh, also kind of is an optional place for students to out come ask for help, uh, to work on things, that sort of stuff. Uh, so one of the key pieces here is the path. So you've got this computational thinking lands that you want to bring these students to. So, but these are very busy students. They're high school, or you could apply this easily in a college setting, university students. And they have a lot of things going on. And maybe, no matter how interested they are, they just don't have the time. So they are maybe a tourist. They may, need to, they may not be able to come and do stuff except for during the meeting. Well, that's OK. We've got, they can do that. But maybe they have more time, and they want to do more with the Wolfen language. Uh, then they can learn more. Uh, or at the other extreme, if they wanted to do a project or they really got interested in Wolfen language, uh, like a lot of us here, then they could, s and they had the time to spend, they could spend that time and do a project. Uh, and so basically, the having different paths that based on how much time they, people can spend, it basically gives students permission to come as they are, because then a tourist does, isn't, doesn't feel like, oh, I can't do the, what the other people in the class are doing because I don't have enough time. I might as well not participate. Or the expat might, is able to say, uh, they, they can't say, oh, I, I'm way ahead. I'm more interested in this than other people. I, I, I'd, be, I'd be too far ahead for it to be useful for me to show up. And that way, everybody feels they have permission to come as where they are. Uh, so just as far as platform, I designed it in Google Docs, uh, or sorry, Google Classroom, just because it was free and easy to use. Uh, so OK, so the topics. The topics are kind of the central piece here. Uh, and again, the question is, what could I use this for? So the three components are. What is an example of something computational thinking Wolfen language can do? Uh, examples, and, and the key about the examples is they have to kind of, there's a balance between generality and specificity you have to strike. Because they have to be general enough that you can apply them to lots of different things and they'll be interesting to a, lar a large set of the students. But they also have to be specific enough that uh, you, that the student can actually understand what's going on uh, with the code, even if they don't understand all of it, at least ideally they should be able to modify the code without too much help uh, to do something useful that's not what it was originally written to apply to. Uh, 
So that's kind of the key there. And then the third piece is so that the students can go further if it's something that they find interesting, whether the further resources, where the further places for them to go. Uh, as far as like choosing what to do a topic presentation about, it's kind of the obvious considerations. Uh, what's the existing culture at your school? What would people find useful? I happen to come from a very humanities-oriented school, and so there's a kind of a strong demand for that. But also, what is surprising? Because there's everybody knows that math and Attica can do math and science. So, what are the things that are surprising? And honestly, that is the humanities stuff. It's the stuff like mapping and text analysis, and uh, I mean even some of the machine learning stuff. Uh, and so. Uh, personally, I didn't actually write a single STEM-related session. All of mine are on the other stuff because that's what's surprising, that's what's not obvious uh, as far as, and that's also the audience that I'm trying to appeal to as far as convincing some people that this is important. So, okay, so here's a few examples of the sessions that I did. So, obvious example would be Wolfram Alpha, one of our first sessions, it's a great entry point. Uh, especially with Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition coming out soon, that this, this type of exploration will be even more powerful. Uh, but, I mean, it didn't have to do a whole lot for it because I just did an 80-second video that I found somewhere on the Wolfram website, and then I basically said, okay, jump in and explore. Uh, all right, another one, Notebook Interface. It's one of the first sessions that we do. Uh, but I also built it almost entirely from an existing presentation. So this is a thing that you don't have to do a long thing and you don't have to be, uh, write a whole lot necessarily yourself. You're, uh, because with the, with the template, all you really need to do is find somebody else who's already written a code. You can find code that's already out there somewhere or a presentation that's already out there somewhere uh, and you just can then repurpose that. It's just not in the format or in an obvious to find place necessarily, so you just put it, you can just find it and put it into your presentation. So uh, it's, it, that makes it a lot easier, especially if you're not necessarily an expert, you couldn't write the code. If you can at least understand the code and find it, that's good enough, and it allows you to talk about a lot of different things. Uh, so. Uh, Maps is another one that I did. It is in EIWL, but I wanted to get to it sooner. Uh, since maps are kind of one of the surprising aspects of Wolfram Language, it's also very useful uh, for a lot of different things. Uh, you can plot uh, historic history data. You can do things about analyzing uh, English texts. And uh, basically, it, it's a very, very diverse tool for studying especially humanities types of things. So I wanted to get to it sooner. Uh, okay, so here's getting into more of the actual nitty gritty type uh, analysis examples. So social network graphs. I took a Wolfram blog post about analyzing Shakespeare's texts and I changed the subject of that. I, I just took the code and I changed it from Othello to Hamlet. And because that's what my school studies uh, but, I mean, I was able to do that very easily, and so, of course, the students there could take the code very easily and adapt it to a different play that they were studying, uh, especially a Shakespeare play. Uh, so, and we've got then this nice visual, which you can use either as a source for further computation, since it is a Wolfram language graph, or you could just use it as a nice visual. You can see Hamlet's at the center, Horatio, his best friend is kind of right next to him. That's, that makes, that all kind of makes sense. Uh, okay, uh, and here's another example. So literary style analysis. So comparing two different pieces of text. Uh, I, I have an excerpt here from that session. Uh, the first part I cover uh, fine textual answer, which is kind of a nice big machine learning function. And then I also mentioned kind of doing a, a word search in a text. Like that's, a, that's something that you wouldn't necessarily think of, of doing necessarily with the Wolfram language, but it is something that it is a computational idea. It's a, it's a computational uh, approach to looking at a text. And even making that connection is kind of uh, useful to make. So 
And then I talk about this getting into analyzing. So basically, I start with my clear statement of purpose, uh, which is to stylistically compare different speakers in a play. And of course, you could adapt this to any two texts, but I'm looking at the dialogue in a play. Uh, so I got the text of Hamlet using this code, which uh, is code that I had already introduced before. So students, uh, oh. Okay, I suppose I'm not going to be running the code today. <laughs> um, so the, the, the students already know, either they know what it does or they could do it on their own. Or in this particular case, this is just getting the text and cleaning it up in a way that you could just do by hand, actually. So this is not something that's too hard to do. Uh, and then I take, let's pick three characters from that play. And so, if, and then I get their dialogue. So this example here, it's, you can see how easily you could modify that to, to any other character from the play, uh, any other character from another play you might happen to have, et cetera. Uh, so uh, basically they can then look at any characters they want, anything. And then once they have that data, they can do whatever they want with analyzing the comp comparison. So you can make a word cloud of the data, it gives you a nice uh, uh, overview of, the, of a comparison. Uh, you can uh, look at, okay, who speaks the most? Hamlet, kind of the obvious result, but Claudius maybe surprisingly speaks a lot less than Hamlet, surprisingly less. Uh, and Ophelia, maybe given her role, speaks even less. Uh, so that maybe is not as surprising, but it it's verifies what you might think. So, okay, who tends to speak the longest on average? Well, Hamlet obviously is up there, but surprisingly, Claudius maybe has more longer spe uh, speeches, which is interesting, because you usually would think of Hamlet as the one who's writing, uh, who is, has all the soliloquies. Um, so you can look at a histogram, make, look at the distribution. Well. Okay, you start to see, okay, Hamlet does have the longest one down here and has some pretty long ones here, but Claudius also has a lot more long ones up here, and Hamlet has a lot of these really short quips. So that would explain why that maybe that result happened, that, uh, why we got that result. So, and now I've kind of given a brief, quick uh, one-off here of analysis, and now students can take that and do whatever analysis they want. They have the, they have the dialogue, they can do any sort of text uh, they want on that, and it's open-ended. And if they don't, if they did not find that gripping at all, they can go back to doing whatever it was they, they found interesting. But if they found this interesting, then this is a whole new avenue for them to explore, and they've already got something they can easily adapt. Uh, okay, so, uh, to wrap up, so far, it uh, turns out I couldn't hold people for more than 30 minutes. I didn't realize that, but that's actually kind of fine. That's exactly the sort of thing of I'm giving them something and then letting them choose what to do with their time. So uh, we've had good attendance as far as uh, in the context of my school. Uh, uh, we haven't done, obviously there's no assignments, we haven't done any projects yet. We're starting to turn to that. Uh, and so because of that, there hasn't necessarily been a whole lot of off activity in office hours because of that. Uh, but I think that'll, that'll probably change soon. Uh, the presentations have been going very smoothly, uh, which is, that's a part of the design that's been working well. And we actually just had our mid-semester survey. So uh, here is a few uh, excerpts from the, the feedback that I got from the mid-semester survey, uh, and I'll let you Read that for a moment. So uh, here, here is a, another question that I asked that people uh, had the chance to respond to. And uh, here, here's the last question. So what have you learned, uh, as it were? Yeah. 
So uh, as you can see, the feedback that I've been getting has been very much in line with what I was trying to go for. Uh, and I, I'm, kind, I'm very excited for how this is going to continue into the future. So uh, as far as action items, uh, if you're interested in seeing some of the, the materials that I built in Google Classroom, just talk to me. I can give you that link. Uh, or send me a message in Pathable. Uh, the slides and also my computational essay about computational essays and kind of the, the role that that serves in, uh, in, in, in a school setting, in an academic setting, uh, those are on Pathable if you want to look at those. And then I also have posts on the Wolfram community talking about this stuff. So you, you, you can look me up on the Wolfram community. Uh, as far as like action items, so if you're a student, uh, start a club or a class on computational thinking. Uh, think about what role computational thinking can play in your curriculum. So, and then act on that. Start using that in your, in your classes and then impress your instructors. Uh, and then the same goes what if for faculty and staff. So impress your students with what the Wolfram language can do. Uh, look and, and find the Wolfram student ambassadors and the other Wolfram th enthusiasts at your school and, and, and see if you can find somebody to partner with to create this, to create a club or a course uh, and start showing people what you can do with computational thinking. So uh, I, I think I've, I've, I've made a good uh, first step at this, this goal of developing a culture of computational thinking. Uh, and I think this experiment is working out fairly well so far, and it'll be exciting to see where it goes. Uh, thank you for coming. Are there any questions?